Hi, I'm joining us today for our live webinar, Know the Code, Understanding Industrial Standards and Specifications. My name is Kim Melton, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's presentation. Joining also are Mary Mikulajewski from ASTM and Doug Fast from Johns Mandeville. Uh, before we dive into introductions with these guys, though, I'd like to go over a few logistics. First, and we will conclude the webinar with a live Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can actually submit those via the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. And if you are seeing that box, if you look in the top right corner, there should be a little box with a question mark in it with Q&A beneath it. If you click that, that will open up a dialog box that you can use to submit questions. To get into um, a little bit about John's Manville and experience. So uh, frequently asked whether or not we send out these presentations upon their conclusion. And while we don't actually send out the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online for you to watch at leisure or share with your colleagues. Now, this ensures that you can get the context that within its full presentation or the presentation within its full context. And um, that's actually part of how we deliver the JM experience to you. So at John Manville, the JM experience is part of our career, and it's based on four pillars people, passion, perform, and protect. And we offer webinars just like this one to help educate the market, <clears throat> excuse me, and offer a tool or a resource for you and your business. Um, we're continuously striving to improve these webinars. So if you have comments after you've viewed this webinar today or you feel like there's something we missed or we could have done better, we'd like to encourage you to fill out a survey that we're going to send out at the end of the webinar. And we'll use your feedback to improve our webinars and provide the information that has the most value to you. With that, we'll go ahead and get into some introdu introductions. And Mary, if you could take a few minutes and introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mary Michalajewski, and I am the tech I'm a technical committee operations manager here at ASTM International. ASTM International is a not-for-profit organization that develops voluntary consensus standards and also the staff manager for committee C16 on thermal insulation, which is uh, primarily the committee that we're discussing today for the presentation. My name is Doug Fast. I'm a senior research engineer with Johns Manville. I'm a professional engineer uh, with a mechanical emphasis, and uh, I've been with Johns Manville for about 20 years and uh, also spent that same amount of time in, in building materials and uh, insulation applications. Um, also, um, I have involvement with ASTM, and I'm secretary of uh, ASTM C1620. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about what that is and what that means. And um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mary and, and let her um, talk about uh, what is ASTM is. All right, Doug. So I did in my introduction, ASTM International is a not-for-profit organization that develops international consensus standards. In a uniquely open process, we develop voluntary standards that influence every aspect of daily life. Those are global, practical, and relevant, making them the first choice for companies, organizations, and governments around the world. It was established in 1898. We currently have 147 committees with 12,500 standards. Our base is around 32,000 members, 8,000 of which are international members from 135 countries. And 5,100 of ASTM standards that are used in 75 different countries. ASTM is accredited by the American National Standards Institute, which is ANSI, and we are also, also accredited by the Standards Council of Canada. The process does does comply with the WTO principles which found in Annex 4 of the WTO TP agreement, and I will explain a little further about that later. So our standards are industry-driven, which means we take a bottom-up approach to standards development. We do thrive on the development and delivery of information made uncomplicated, and we also have no project costs. That means is basically we have no registration fees to attend our meeting. The principles that make ASTM standards accepted and trusted worldwide is openness. We gather experts, 
individuals, organizations, academia, governments, associations, consultants, and consumers from all over the world. These members come together to exchange expertise and knowledge, and they participate in a transparent process that's open to anyone anywhere with an interest in the standards development and use. This means that as well as being timely and relevant, an ASTM standard is fully representative of the sectors to which it applies. And committees are provided access to access and infrastructure to develop ASTM standards. So what it is we do have available tools online. So we have online templates, we have online balloting, we have online collaboration areas so that uh, committees can come together to work on their new activities. Uh, for meeting support, each committee has a technical committee manager assigned to it, as well as an editor. And so at this point in time that ASTM does not, ASTM staff does not write standards. We remain neutral in the process. Just talk a little bit about the power of partnership. All members of an ASTM committee are involved in the standards development process. We have a neutral forum for stakeholders to come together to develop the standards. We have a census process that's based on procedures. So all committees must adhere to the regulations governing an ASTM committee as well as the committee's bylaws. Both and public sectors come together to cooperate in the standards development. Every member has an equal say. Official vote is given per voting interest. Again, I will get into this more in detail in a later slide. So this is the technical committee structure of an ASTM committee. So all ASTM committees have a main committee, the committees, and they have task groups. So main committees are to address specific industry subjects. Subcommittees will address subsets of specialized subject matter. And subcommittees will also organize their expertise into task groups to the standards. And direct member participation takes place. So we'll become part of task groups to work on the development of a new activity or a new standard or even revision to an existing standard. Some key points for participation is that as a member of ASTM, you would join subcommittees and task groups that would be of interest to your organization. The ballot for all, all items and all ballot items that are, that are sent out, and that, that's because this is what your voice is in the process. And to keep up to date on all meeting and committee information, that is posted to the ASTM website. Regulations require that all the classified technical committees are balanced. To balance, a committee cannot have more producers, for example, manufacturers, which will voting rights than non-producers, which would for other classifications of user general interest and consumer. This ensures that the manufacturers do not dominate the standards development process and the standards have market relevance and can be utilized by all of the industry. Some regulations explicitly state that a company or interest can only have one vote. If there are 15 members from an organization on the technical committee, only those employees can hold the official vote. This will ensure that larger organizations do not dominate the standards development. Small and large organizations, including individuals, need representation on the committee. However, and most importantly, all members, whether have an official vote or not, have the right to vote on all ballot items. Official voter casts a negative on ballot. That negative must be handled just like any other negative received, official voter or not. Rights come into play when calculating the statistical requirements for a valid ballot, when doing quorum for conducting official committee business, 
or your hand for a motion at a meeting, such as for a not persuasive negative. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what the ASTM process is. So ASTM has three levels of balloting. We have subcommittee ballot level, we have the main committee ballot, and we have what we call concurrent and society review. Standards activity must go through subcommittee ballot at least once prior to moving on to the subcommittee. So at that group level, as I stated in a previous slide, is where the bulk of the, the work is being done on the development of the standard. And official balloting takes place at the task group level. You can, the task group sometimes take a straw poll to decide if the document is ready to move on to ballot is accepted by the task group, they move on to what we call committee ballot. So our committee ballot is open for a minimum of 30 days. We have a 60% return with a two-thirds approval. And on passes subcommittee ballot, it would move on to main committee. Or um, item that has gone through at least one subcommittee ballot can also move on to main committee ballot. Ballot is also open for a minimum of 30 days. For the committee, we, we require also require a 60% return, but we need a 90% approval. And society ballots happen at the same time, so concurrent ballot is a simultaneous ballot of the subcommittee and the main committee at the same time. And this can occur once item has gone through at least subcommittee ballot at least one. Top level of um, balance here is just our committee on standards. And it is a standing committee that ASTM has that this committee must review all not persuasive and all not related actions. Um, and it's just to ensure that the ASTM process is being followed correctly. about the role of ASTM standards. So built on the work of our founders in the early rail industry, ASTM standards again ensure safety, quality, and reliability. But progress never stops. We're clearly responding to new challenges, new technology, and new markets. By new standards and enhancing established ones. ASTM standards can be revised or reapproved at any time. We have development process on voluntary consensus. This gives everyone an opportunity to participate in creating and defining a standard. It ensures that our standards are effective and relevant across the diverse markets we serve. Standards underpin contracts, laws, and regulations. They support established and emerging economies, ultimately free and fair global trade. Now, be familiar with uh, some of the, the existing standards that are there. So, while we have company standards, you could have a consortium standard, you could have industry standards, you, you could have a government standard, or you could have a voluntary consensus standard. And this is where ASTM sits. So, our voluntary consensus standard organization. Census is developed by representatives of all the sectors that have an interest in the use of the standard. The standards with their broad input are considered by many as the most technically sound and credible documents. They are used as the basis for commercial and regulatory action. Now I will show you that ASTM has six different types of standards. So a committee can create any one of these standards. So we have specifications, which are explicit sets of requirements to be satisfied by a material product system service. We have services, which are a set of instructions for performing one or more specific operations that does not produce a test result. We have guides, which organize collection of information or series of options that does not re recommend a specific course of action. 
We have two methods, which is a definitive procedure that produces a test fault. We have vacations, which is a systematic arrangement or division of materials, products, systems, or services into based on similar characteristics such as origin, composition, properties, or use. And then we have terminology standards, which is basically a collection of terms that are used by the committee. Okay, so our ASTM standards used in industry and regulation. So again, uh, repeating, uh, ASTM standards are developed voluntarily and used voluntarily. Voluntarily. They become mandatory when they are cited in code. Uh, can be cited in contracts, used by tens of thousands of individuals, companies, and agencies global. So AM does have a robust uh, MU program. So we have over 160 MUs with trees that reference, adopt, or sell ASTM standards. And then government agencies reference them in codes, certifications, regulations, and laws. There are six different ways that an ASTM standard can be adopted and referenced. So what we have available to the public and private sectors are that you can reference an ASTM standard in regulation, you can reference a standard in code, or you can have a normative reference to a standard. And the next slide, I'll get into a little bit more about what we mean through about a normative reference. We have three different ways that you can adopt and reference an ASTM standard globally, which is available to our MOU partners. So then, they identically adopt an ASTM standard. They can adopt standard to an equivalent adoption with deviations, or use an ASTM standard as the basis of a national standard. So AM subscribes to the principles of coherence as outlined in the World Trade Organization's Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement which emphasizes the importance of international standardizing bodies of duplication of or up with the work of other international standardizing bodies. So what it means is that ASTM does avoid duplication of content and effort of other SDOs that exist. We do encourage normatively referencing documents um, within ASTM standards as encouraging other SDOs to reference ASTM standards within the documents. Also establish liaisons between organizations and related, A to, and related ASTM committees um, to ensure that we are referencing standards that would be applicable from other SDOs or from other related committees. Uh, and also has a business development department, department that, can, that can look into agreements with our organizations. And we can also explore um, copyright issues where we do have the ability to develop dual logo standards. These bonds would report out during committee meetings at the executive, subcommittee, and main committee level. All the industry will determine the needs and best services for the market. So you as a member of the ASTM Technical Committee would decide if the normative reference is um, needed for the standard that you're developing. It would be up to the committee to monitor the references that are that exist within the ASTM standard. So if reference is outdated, uh, the you would need to remove it and replace it with the current existing standard. I'm going to get into a little bit of the U.S. legal and policy framework. We have the National Technology Transfer and Advancement Act of 1995. We also have the OMB circular number A119. The policy for federal use of standards. So all federal agencies must use voluntary consensus standards in lieu of government unique standards in their procurement and regulatory activities, except inconsistent with law or otherwise impractical. 
In these circumstances, your agency must submit a report describing the reason for its use of government unique standards in lieu of voluntary consensus standards to Office of Management and Budget through National Institute of Standards and Technology. So a policy for federal participation in voluntary consensus standards bodies. So AIDS must consult with voluntary consensus standards bodies, both domestic and international, and must participate with such bodies in the development of voluntary consensus standards. Consultation and participation is public interest and is compatible with their missions, authorities, priorities, and budget resources. So OMB Circular 119 just this discourages federal agencies from using government unique standards. Stated in a previous screen as well, we, ASM does adhere to the WPO principles of standard development. So part of the ASTM has been so successful at the global relationship is because we embrace the principles for international standards development laid out by the World Trade Organization's Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement. Six principles are up on this screen now are crucial from ensuring a process that is transparent and open to supporting the development dimensions of our MOU program. <clears throat> the fact is tariffs are becoming less of a factor in trade due to increasing number of free trade agreements throughout the world while regulations, conformity assessment, and standards are becoming more important. Needless to say, standards should not be misused as trade barriers. The DO agreement identifies standards as a key component of trade and permits their use as not tariff barriers. This is just a, this is just a slide that Summary has some examples of the usage and acceptance of ASTM standards. Standards, again, are used by buyers and sellers in contract agreements, organizations, standard operating procedures, which use ASTM standards, uh, and rating and training programs are built based off of ASTM standards. Standards are built into codes. And financial pro providers programs requirements as well. There's global applications for the use of ASTM standards, so we are do consider ourselves an international standards organization. Uh, can um, have ASTM standards referenced in international codes, and so have standards standard support and facilitate trade. Okay, so I'm just a little bit about our committee C16 on thermal insulation. So C16 was formed in 1938. We have 470 plus members that are part of the C16 committee. We have 166 approved standards to date, uh, with 17 ones that are in development. And a white item is just a new standard activity. Uh, meeting for our C16 group will be held in uh, April 8th through 13th in San Diego. And currently we have 12 different active subcommittees that are working on the development of standards. Uh, those subcommittees are listed on, on the screen here as well. Just to point out, there's uh, Doug going to get into his presentation. We'll point out these three different keywords for C16. Uh, so we'll be discussing standard C335, C578, and C1617. So these are some key standards uh, that we'll be discussing. At this point in time, I'm going to transfer back over to Doug, and he'll get us into the aspects of our presentation. All right, I just had a head here with this. Let me uh, fix this here real quick. And we'll get get right to talking about 
vendors and specifications. My apologies for the delay. Um, to kind of start off with, uh, I, I think Mary gave us a really good background on, on ASTM and what they do, um, and, uh, and conceptually, there, there's a lot of really great things that they do. Um, as far as a, an, um, a laboratory goes, and, and actually as a manufacturer that, that uh, supports a lab, I um, thought we would uh, go through and talk about how we use some of these things. Um, now, the Johns Manville Technical Center is it's an accredited lab uh, by the National Vol by NAVLAP, the National Voluntary lab accreditation program uh, for some of these standards that you see here. Um, thermal performance, of course, because we're, a, we're an insulin manufacturer, um, but of course we also care about uh, flammability, strength, uh, mass density, dimensional stability, um, and a lot of acoustical and, and water vapor um, thing go along with insulation because that's just the environment that those, those products live in. An example um, of, a, of a test method is STM84, which is surface burning, which a lot of you might have be familiar with. Uh, but here you see um, on the left hand side you'll see a flame that's that's in this tunnel, and on the right hand side you see an operator that's actually measuring how far that flame is propagating. Now STM84, it's it has things like the, the dimensions of the tunnel, the airflow that needs to be going, how you calculate the results, and and how you, uh, how you interpret those. Another um, area of expertise that we have would be um, acoustics, and uh, we want to use things like uh, a reverberation room, which you see on our left, which we use to calculate sound absorption coefficients. Um, and again, we need a test method to tell us how to do that. It needs to tell us a microphone placement, how many diffusers that we need, um, how, uh, how often our, our microphones uh, should be calibrated, those, those types of things, or suggestions, and then also how to calculate those results and, and present those. Um, our echoic chamber, uh, same thing. There's there's specifications around that, and so way you can take results from um, from our lab, run the same test in another lab, and get consistent results, and that way um, it, it makes sure that uh, the industry has has the best information to work with. Um, again, because we're an insulation company, um, we we know a little bit about thermal testing. One of the things that um, the thing is, when we think of thermal testing, we, we just think of uh, some KI or, or some say that we're looking for on a data sheet or, or some input that we need for computer programming, a software like 3D Plus. Um, one thing that, that we don't know, that know is clearly understood is how is something tested. In this case, you, if you look on the left-hand side, um, you have a, a heat flow meter, um, which is used to measure thermal performance um, of a material. As, it, as it's in a flow orientation. So on the top, uh, you might have a hot plate. On the bottom, you have a cold plate, and then you're just measuring uh, the amount of heat that's, tra that's uh, transferring through the insulation. Okay, on the right-hand side, you have a pipe assembly, which uh, would be in a room. You would heat the pipe to a certain temperature, and uh, you measure kind of the installed performance of pipe insulation. So even though it's the same base material, you would expect to have the same thermal performance uh, depending on how the orientation is and how you test it, you do get slightly different results. On top of that, um, we'll see it on in, in a subsequent slide here. Um, and also at the top of this, we measure um, the, the standard factors for estimating maximum use temperature of thermal insulations, um, which is another test method that we use. Um, what we see here is uh, mineral wool examples. So using a test method, we can determine what the maximum use temperature is of a product. Um, and we're looking for uh, warping, cracking, delaminating, uh, delamination, shrinking, things like that. So um, we can characterize these products so that uh, um, so that the end user can make sure they're using the appropriate product. Um, things like electron microscopy and uh, maybe a lot outside of ASTM, but just some of the some of the things that, that we also look at. And in this case, we're looking at um, surface corrosion and, and pitting on the surface of a sample. Uh, if you look at the image on the right-hand side, you can actually see that that uh, dark pit there. Uh, that's localized corrosion, and that's actually the, uh, the dark part uh, would be um, kind of that atmosphere above, and then that silver part's the actual metal, so you can see where it's deteriorating. And that's the bad thing with a pit is you you actually can't even see how how it's uh, corroding in there. It looks like a small dot on the top, but uh, big on the bottom. So with lab, we can we can uh, look at those things and 
determine how our product is going to perform. One of the things that we talk about is, is third-party testing and research. Um, you know, even though uh, a company might have uh, a certain capability to test things, one of the questions always comes up is that, uh, and rightly so, that if you're a manufacturer and you have a lab and you're producing results, um, it's fair to say that, that uh, there could be some cloud of judgment on that. Um, even though our labs are accredited and, and they, are, they don't report to a business unit, that's still a question in somebody's mind. So what we'll do is, is actually go to third-party testing, and, uh, which could be either another manufacturer or for-profit labs that exist throughout the nation, um, again, that are also involved with ASTM. Uh, they can do testing to kind of verify internal results. The um, thing is, uh, because, uh, you know, for-profit uh, labs a lot of times see more diverse testing than, than we do, uh, as a manufacturer, we tend to focus on insulation and, and kind of basic insulation materials. Outside labs might have capability, and they see a broader perspective of what's available in the, in the marketplace to test. So that's the reason to go to an outside lab. Certifications, um, certainly, uh, you know, certifications uh, that you might have with something like UL or um, organizations that do verification of testing, they're going to want to do their own testing. So, uh, which we understand, if we're going to be putting our label on something saying that we're guaranteeing it, we probably want to make sure that we test it. Uh, test methods as far as uh, third party verification, we talked about that a little bit with work items, and in many cases when you want to make a modification, or create a test method, you want to get uh, several labs involved to kind of help flesh out uh, the test, what it's reporting, is it is it uh, relevant, is it uh, repeatable, those are the things that you want to do. And of course, uh, verification, um, one of the things that ASTM is, uh, encourages, and I know NavLab encourages as well, is what they call a round robin where uh, a reference sample will be sent to uh, five or six different participating labs. Labs, they test it, and then the results are reviewed um, at uh, certain ASTM task groups to ensure that um, that everybody is doing the same measurement the same way, following procedure, uh, to make sure that everybody's performing the test equivalently, and that they also have equipment that's very similar, if not the same. We're going to talk a little bit about what what the results mean, and Mary talked about this earlier about. Uh, um, ASTM doesn't have uh, any pass-fail criteria. They, they're pretty much uh, uh, more administrative, and they, they oversee to make sure that the certain rules are, are followed, but it's really up to the, to the test groups and the subcommittees and main committees to, to determine uh, whether these tests are relevant or not. So the um, question is, what does a test tell us? Um, when we're trying to approximate real-world conditions, although we might uh, go to more extremes, um, for example, if we're doing industrial insulation, we want to test things at industrial temperatures in industrial conditions. If we're te testing building insulation, we're, uh, we're probably more concerned with uh, moisture and uh, but lower temperatures. Um, several different types of tests. Um, a lot of times you'll hear uh, whether AST, something passes or fails in ASTM tests, which might not be appropriate. Um, you have pass-fail tests as an example. Uh, there's ASTM E136, which is a measure of combustibility. So there's criteria in that test whether um, if certain conditions are met, um, the product could pass, or if conditions are not met, it could, could, uh, then the product would fail. Uh, pretty easy. Uh, and generally speaking, if you have something in a standard specification, if it fails, typically it's not going to be in that, in that standard specification. Um, like something like C1101, where you're actually bending insulation around a around a pipe, and you're looking to see if that in, insulation actually uh, shingles or breaks, or did, does it flex around it? Like that's a pass fail. It either does it or it doesn't. Um, finally, we have, as an example, we have ASTM C665, and we're visually comparing two coupons, and does one appear uh, to have more surface discoloration than the other? So again, pass fail. Um, you have something with, which you uh, have more of a, a discrete result. And uh, as an example, thermal testing, you'll run a product um, or a material, and you come up with a number, for good or bad. Um, this method doesn't say. It just says you test it, you get this number, um, and it's really uh, somewhere else that there's that it's going to be interpreted, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, 
a lot of people have uh, probably heard about E84 flame spread and smoke development. You know, what does that mean? Um, generally speaking, again, we test the product, we get a result, um, but usually if there's some other judgment. It could be a building code, it could be a government body, or it could be an end user that has determined what's acceptable and what isn't. Generally speaking, if you have something that has a 25 uh, flame spread and a uh, smoke development or less, uh, that product can be left exposed. Um, same with 5.0, uh, but if so, it's something that's much larger, then um, generally speaking, you'd have to cover it up. But again, it depends on the on who's interpreting that. Is that a code or is that um, written into a requirement for a government specification or a builder or, or who else interested in that information? Um, there's, there's some other uh, information here. Uh, the uh, C1617 corrosion, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, and it just gives us a number. It's really up to some standard or some specification to tell you whether that's a good or a bad number. And it can depend on the material type. And finally, um, you know, discrete result, and you can almost say this is a pass fail, but um, this is a fire test where you run the test to tell uh, the product physically fails. Um, and then you have you have some time that it takes for it to, for this condition to be met. So if I see that I've tested this in accordance with this, I can't say that I passed this test because really I, uh, everything fails. But I could say that it did meet a two-hour um, it, it did make it to two hours um, beyond two hours before it failed. So again, uh, depends on on the, the context of of what the requirements are. Um, Test result, they always tell us what, what the product did in a given situation. And again, situations vary depending on the test method. You get different results depending on what your, your additions are. I'll talk that a little bit later. So we get test results, and we, we know that we're supposed to have them. We know they're supposed to be good, but what, what does that mean? Um, now, test results are usually in specifications, and specifications are usually what determines is gonna, whether something is acceptable or not. Um, typically, you have to pass the pass-fail test. And you're, you're going to have some target or threshold value that you have to meet um, in, a, in a, a discrete test. It's usually going to be greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, um, or, you know, or, or the pass-fail does contain, does not contain, uh, meets, does not meet. Uh, again, in our earlier example, um, for a small test, um, if we have in our specification that a product must or shall be R13, then the minimum thermal or, or maximum thermal conductivity through KY would be equal to 0.25 at, at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So those are very specific criteria. And again, if you look at the, the maximum thermal conductivity, um, you have to also remember what numbers you're looking at. Small numbers for thermal conductivity are good. Uh, big numbers are generally not as good. But if you're looking at something like sound absorption, high numbers are better than low numbers. So you want to know what number you're looking for. Uh, we talked about uh, ASTM E84, so if, if it must be less than 2550, that's usually um, out for you. Linear shrinkage maximum 2%, um, you have some criteria. Um, same with the, the ones that you see here. There's always going to be, a, in a specification, some kind of interpretation, and, and we'll see an example of that as, as well in a second slide. Now, uh, results establish minimum product requirements. And so, um, and when we have a specification, it's going to be kind of the bare minimum. So the goal of a producer is that you want to meet or exceed those um, as, uh, requirements every single time to make sure that you, this when you're saying that you comply with something. Interpreting thermal, uh, interpreting standards. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, thermal conductivity. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, uh, board flat testing versus pipe testing, and again, we, we're using the same material, same density, same fiber orientation, and actually uh, you fiberize the same way, but you know maybe uh, uh, together in different machines. But we do get different numbers, and again, one is because we can control temperature difference with the flat orientation. It's a more closely uh, um, monitored environment or controlled environment, whereas the pipe test where you're putting it in into a room, we have some fluctuations in room temperature. The temperature of the pipe is usually going to be much higher to get the same median temperature. Um, so that's going to give you some different results. But, you know, the pipe testing is going to give you 
better in situ or installed uh, value of, of how your installation is going to perform. So, as we talked about earlier, if, if you uh, just kind of look at this slide, and let's look at uh, calcium silicate in the upper left-hand corner. Um, if you look at that bottom line, and again, remember that thermal conductivity, the lower the value, the better. So if I'm looking at uh, like a flat orientation, which is that bottom line, that's performing the best out of all three of those lines. Uh, if I go up to uh, more of a uh, to pipe data or information that we got from testing in a pipe configuration, um, you can see that we don't perform as well uh, once we get above 200 degrees. We start seeing things diverge a little bit. Um, but that's okay because if you look at that top line, that's the ASTM uh, uh, maximum that thermal conductivity that that product can be and still meet that ASTM standard specification. So um, as long as you're you're below that line, you're you're meeting your your product requirements and, and your claims, and you're meeting that that. Uh, at uh, ASTM standard specification. And so if, if we look at some of the other ones, whether it's expanded perlite, uh, porous blanket, or mineral wool, we, we see the same thing. The, the ASTM line is the highest, which is what we'd want to have. And then we'd have uh, pipe data, and then below that we would have flat orientation data. So um, again, you want to make sure you're using the right data for, for the correct orientation. Things that, um, that's, uh, that's out there as far as uh, uh, silica aerogel products is that, um, you know, again, we talked about uh, pi versus flat versus ASTM requirements. So we start at the bottom here, or start in this first line. This is the ASTM requirement, and that's for a flat orientation. And that comes right out of that, that ASTM standard specification. Um, and we also have the, this purple line, which is also comes out of the ASTM standard specification for, for, the, for that material. And you can see it's higher, um, just like we saw with the other products. So no, no real surprise, and that's consistent. Um, and those are results we'd expect to see. Um, in this case, one of the things that, that um, we need to be uh, mindful of, at least with this type of product, is you can see that the uh, if you look at the silica aerogel data sheet, you can see that it's right on top of that, that ASTM flat line. And so you know, it, if you look at it, for the most part, it's, it's below on the requirement, but it's kind of right on the edge. So, so um, ideally, as a manufacturer, you always want to put a little bit of a factor of safety or um, to take care of, uh, you know, there's production variation. Sometimes there's, um, you know, if the, if the fibrous product, sometimes it, it might not recover fully, but at least you want to make sure you have enough material there to kind of help uh, in, in case uh, something like this happens. So. Um, so again, if you're kind of right on the edge, you might it might not be a bad idea to add some additional thickness to compensate for that to make sure you get the performance that 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 you require in the product. Uh, why does all this matter? I mean, uh, it's kind of a bunch of nuts and bolts, and and uh, you know, it's test methods. It's, it almost sounds like code. Um, you know, if we're if we're specifications that are that are based on the wrong test results, um, we can we can lead to over and under, under insulating. And see the subsequent uh, slide uh, can also have some impacts on some other characteristics. Over insulating, you have increased material cost. Uh, generally uh, speaking, increased labor cost if you're putting in an additional layer. Um, process control. There's some cases where you you want things to to run a little bit hotter than colder. Um, you know, in some cases you, you want if, if you have uh, something to treat about condensing within a pipe, uh, like a hot gas, you actually want that. Uh, um, Maybe that that uh, uh, that's in there to condense and drain, as opposed to being hot and being transferred farther down the system. The flip side, of course, is if you under insulate, um, you're going to experience heat loss, and because you have uh, less insulation, you're going to have higher surface temperatures, which is going to increase your potential for burns uh, for uh, plant personnel. And process control. Um, again, you, you may uh, you have a situation where um, you're trying to monitor temperatures closely, and if you don't have enough insulation, there, it's, it's much harder to to control things because you're uh, more influenced by ambient uh, effects that that can uh, add or take away heat from your system that you that you didn't account for. Um, so another example, and, and as far as interpreting standards, is is ASTM C 1617 that we mentioned earlier. Um, this is an accelerated uh, corrosion test method. Um, the, the, the difficult thing about corrosion test methods is trying to find one that really quantifies how something is going to perform in the real world 
Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to create some kind of extreme environment, but something that's still plausible, something that we might see um, in our world. So um, essentially what we have here is we're, we're dripping water that has been, um, been with the insulation, and uh, we're dripping it onto a plate that's 230 degrees, and we're um, the, the water drips, it evaporates off, and another drop uh, goes back um, onto that plate. And you're creating a very, very corrosive environment, and, and, and certainly a worst case. So you run this test for 96 hours. Um, you also run some controls with it as well. You have a deionized or distilled water, which is free of uh, impurities. You'll have a one part per million chloride solution and a five part per million chloride solution. And it kind of gives you a, a spectrum of how things are going to compare. Um, you know, to, to other to those controls. Um, so we get these results. If you look at something like uh, mineral wool or, or silica aerogel, you're, you're going to have something that's uh, that's going to have an excess of of uh, you know 15 uh, um, mils per year, and that's the output of this test. It gives you a mass loss corrosion rate. So really, you're measuring the your, the deterioration of that metal. You're, you're cleaning off that scale when the test is run, and that temperature, that weight difference is uh, what you would uh, attribute to corrosion due to that dripping. Knowing that we're going to have a certain mass loss corrosion rate, um, we can kind of anticipate what, what thickness, wall thickness do we need of our piping? Do we need to look at using different insulation materials? Um, maybe I want to use our, our Thermal 1200, our Sproul product that has a corrosion bitter in it. So maybe my mass loss corrosion rate is, is closer to uh, three mils per year, um, about the thickness of a sheet of paper. So um, you certainly want something that's that's going to corrode less, so you can get more usable life out of out of your assets. Um, so, um, but uh, this is a test that gives us a result uh, more of a continuous output. So we could have anything from zero all the way up to, um, gosh, you know, on this scale, up to 40 mils per year. Now, one of the interesting things is. Um, if you look at a data sheet, and let's just say uh, we're, we're comparing uh, our calcium silicate product with a flexible energy blanket or a, a mineral fiber blanket, um, they, they all state, and rightfully so, that they passed this test. Um, now, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, here's where the specification gives, gives some more context. Now, uh, in the 533 calcium silicate insulation, you, it, your corrosion rate has to be less than deionized water. So if you remember from the previous slide, that was five mils per year, um, and the calcium silicate was more like three mils per year. So it's considerably less. Uh, but if you looked at the uh, flexible aerogel or the mineral wool blanket, um, it has to be less than the five part per million chloride solution. Clear more. Um, if you remember that plot, it was con clearly more than the um, than the deionized water, and certainly more than the calcium silicate. But it's also um, up around you know 15, 20 mils uh, per year. So you have uh, you know times of corrosion. But really, looking at a data sheet, um, you would you would look and see that, that these both pass. So flexible aerogel product and the mineral uh, mineral fiber product, they both have much higher um, um, pass rates or much higher uh, tolerances than the calcium silicate product. So when you're looking at these things, you always want to make sure that that you know what you're looking at. And and know the context is and what that that specification requires because uh, you know there's there's different hurdles for different insulation types. They all have their own strengths and weaknesses. Pitfalls and and uh, you know, this and anticipating thermal shift and um, so we'll, we'll just start off with a, a, a definition. Um, the thermal shift is the per change in an insulation material's thermal conductivity due to exposure to high temperatures. Uh, in this example, we're talking about greater than 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what matter? Um, now, one of the things that, that, that uh, I think is historically known is, is most insulation materials types that have been around for 20 or 30 years behave pretty consistently. They're very well understood, um, and certainly there's uh, been ASTM task committees and, and groups around this for many years. Um, very well understood. Uh, but uh, with something uh, that's been observed with silica aerogel, it's something a little bit different. Um, uh, when you, you test the product, and we, we looked at some of those earlier, uh, just looking at, at it maybe even a flat configuration, pipe configuration, doesn't matter. But, but what we see is we, we get uh, some thermal performance, and uh, it's respectable. 
the problem, though, is after we've heated it up the first time and we retest it, uh, what we see is we get different results. Uh, now, actually, when we saw this, we thought something might have happened with our equipment because test equipment does break, and we do have calibration standards that we have to run. But after you results like that, you run a calibration, everything's fine, then you run the material again, you get the same result. Um, you start to figure out that, that uh, you know, maybe there's something else going on here. And again, this is another case of where you'd want to have third-party testing. So this is thing that's only been observed with, with silica aerogel. The, the problem here is that if I'm specifying a certain thermal performance and I see a, a degradation in performance, well, now I'm going to have higher heat loss, I'm going to have higher surface temperatures, um, I'm going to have a decreased uh, system efficiency, and uh, again, if I have something that I'm trying to hold to some pretty high temperatures, I'm um, having more heat loss, so it's going to be harder to kind of compensate for that. Um, anyway, we see the red line that um, on our second cycle, we, we see this, this permanent shift. Um, now, the challenge here, um, if, if, you, if you manufacture silica of aerogel blankets, is that um, you make sure that you meet your ASTM requirements. And um, here's an example of where you, you see where that ASTM line is, where the um, your, your line needs to be, and this is for a flat configuration. Um, so you can see that through most of it, you're kind of half above and half below. You know, things like that happen. There's production variation, but again, if we have a large difference between um, our pipe data and, and where our, our, our uh, maximum thermal conductivity can be, we have some room to to, uh, to make some mistakes and still make sure that we meet it. Um, in this case, you know, if, if you're running pretty close to the line, then, then uh, there's there's a chance that 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 product might be out of spec. And then if you throw on top of that the you have a thermal shift, um, you have to compensate for that and, and add another layer of, of inflation to, to offset that difference. So here's how you avoid that shift is, is number one, knowing that this is going to happen, add uh, you and I with that thermal shift in mind. Generally speaking, you can add an extra layer of insulation. I, and I think in most cases, 10 millimeters would probably do it. but um, again, you'd, you'd want to uh, refer to the manufacturer's recommendations as far as what you would need to add to to that uh, uh, they're getting that thermal performance that you need. With that, um, I can uh, conclude uh, what we're talking about. I'm going to turn it over to Kim, and she's going to talk to us about some additional resources that are available to you. Thank you, Doug. So um, I'd first like to talk about the source. Now, this is actually something we just released on our website, and it's a new portal where you can access free training, specifications, tools, webinars, a blog, et cetera. Um, now, one thing I would like to talk about first is our NEMA 3E Plus tools. So thing we've worked with NEMA to create, basically what it does is it calculates the thickness of insulation you'll need for a specific application based off of the criteria of your of your application. But what we've done specifically with this tool is we put the, the the specification information for our products into the tool. So the output is you want to use a JM product, this will actually give you the, the specific information, the specific thickness of the insulation of the JM product that you need. Now the thing I'd like to talk about is is our webinars. So webinars just like what we had today, we record each of them and we post them on the source. Um, so rewatch today's webinar, maybe a colleague who, who would find it helpful, or you're just looking for information on, on, an, addition, on an additional topic like thunder insulation or even acoustics, you're going to find that information here in our webinar section. Uh, in addition to our webinars, we also host a blog. And we both write and curate content for this blog. <clears throat> Excuse me. So not only relying on our own technical experts, but we're actually going out and finding the best information we can in the industry to help bring that in and make sure you're getting a full perspective of what's there. Now we make this as rich and relevant to you as possible and that's why we go about this uh, this route. So there's also a library of helpful documentation on the source. Um, you'll find technical bulletins, white papers, product application guides, etc. Uh, we strongly encourage you to, to browse this section if you're looking for detailed information about our products or even leading industry issues. And the tools section uh, we have a variety of tools here to make specifying insulation um, as easy as possible. <clears throat> so we have like the smart bind. This actually goes on your phone and um, or iPad or even desktop, and it gives you immediate access to all of our technical documentation. So digits, um, insulation guides, that sort of thing. And you can actually you can save your favorites, you can forward it to people, so on and so forth, so that you can get this information as quickly as possible. Um, also, the NEMA 3E Plus tool, like I said. And even the product application 
marketing tool, and this is a tool that allows you to uh, assign specific values to the characteristics your application needs, and then the, it calculates the best product for the needs of your application. So um, on that note, for everybody who attended the live webinar today, you will receive a certificate of completion. It will be sent to you directly via email to your, to your inbox by Friday. And um, with that, let's go ahead and get into some questions. So the first question we had is, um, Doug, I'm going to direct this one at you, and that is, we currently shape mold expanded polystyrene at 1.3 pounds per cubic foot density. What type of physical property requirement chart would we be able to claim? Uh, um, let's have to look that up, but typically they, they would have uh, um, and I believe with the extruded polystyrene, they're going to have a density requirement or a compressive strength requirement. Um, I see. I um, I'd have to. Uh, why don't we get that that uh, that's uh, information and and uh, okay. I'll have to get back with them on that. Great. We'll take offline. Uh, the next question is why are there past standards different for different products? I think this is referring specifically to the uh, ASTM C 1617 test. Um, you know, as, uh, I, I think as Mary uh, talked about, you know, every different task group kind of has their own requirements and kind of what they agree on. So, um, you, uh, you know, um, because that's decided as a group, it, it might have been decided that, uh, you know, if you had something that has a corrosion inhibitor, you could have lower requirements. Um, what also could have been, it could have been a legacy thing, too, because the ASC 1617 is, is fairly new. It's been, been under development for probably the last um, in 10 years, and it's only been in, in uh, I think, in ASTM for the last uh, three or four. So sometimes you, you have uh, um, you kind of just have results that you have with the product that you have, and, and uh, you want to make sure that everybody uh, can, meet, can meet those requirements. Um, and I know that Mary didn't go uh, talk about that a little bit, but you just want to make sure that you're not limiting trade. So you want to make sure that uh, part, people that are participating in that category, you want to make sure that they all have product that can uh, meet those those standards as a category. I don't know if that answers the exact question, but um, that, that's kind of the way those those things typically work. It's the limits are usually agreed on. Mary's next one's for you, and that is how often does ASTM adapt and evolve its standard specifications? So ASTM standards, as part of our regulations, a standard has to be revised or reapproved every five years. Um, but there are no limits to when a standard can be revised. So a standard can be revised at any time uh, through any member participating on the committee can bring uh, new data to the table. And uh, at that time, the committee would then evaluate that work and decide if the, if the exist standard needs to be revised. But part of the regulations, again, the does have to review standards every five years. Thank you. The next question is, what should I do if the standards have changed such that the materials that were previously within code are now, long, now no longer compliant? Um, I think, generally speaking, uh, as far as uh, building codes and things like that go, they, they want to have the most up-to-date and current uh, products. So if there's something that uh, is no longer allowed, then if I, my standing and uh, you need to really consult your local area having jurisdiction, but or authority having jurisdiction, uh, but generally speaking, uh, if you were replacing it, you would just take out the old material and put in put in the new. Um, I don't know; it's, it's as much of an issue. I, I don't. Know, I think the insulation, but I know with things like uh, electrical things, like aluminum wire, things like that, um, those codes, uh, you know, get updated. And, and of course, those materials are updated as well to make sure that you're using certain types of copper. But uh, generally speaking, you you should go talk to for governing that and and kind of get their take on that. So Doug, elaborate that on that. I guess from a um, an industrial perspective, is there is, is it a similar process for industrial applications? If the standard specification is changed, industrial it's it's a little more lenient. Um, um, to, uh, and and I guess uh, something that's no longer combined. The only thing I could think of is. Uh, I think everybody's still using the same materials, although some might contain asbestos, and of course, there's going to be an industrial hygienist uh, on site to, to deal with, with that, or, you know, there's uh, there's OSHA, those kind of regulatory uh, 
um, bodies that, that can relate that. Um, generally speaking, if, if, if it's old, it's worn out, it needs to be replaced, um, then it has to be replaced with the newer stuff. Uh, the older out of compliance stuff either isn't made or uh, it might come in from overseas and, and might not meet those ASTM specifications. Okay. Um, Mary, this one's for you, and that is, does the drive toward energy efficiency have any impact on standard specification? I, I would say yes. yes. That would be something that companies uh, would specifically discuss um, when developing their, their particular standard. Um, and if there were a group of individuals that are, were part of the committee that, that um, thought that was neat, then uh, yes, that, that could happen. Great. Uh, the next one is for you, Doug, and that is the aerogel insulation thermal conductivity drift is startling. For don't other insulation materials also deteriorate with either time or exposure or both? I was thinking about CalSIL's retention of atmospheric vapor. Okay. Uh, specifically with with uh, calcium silicate uh, water retention, typically that product is uh, has a maximum or a recommended temperature range of uh, ambient to 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the uh, advantage of, of industrial insulations is they typically operate at higher temperatures, so water vapor isn't a problem or, or water isn't a problem as long as everything is running. Uh, yes, as soon as you, you turn things off, um, you know, th there could be opportunities for water intrusion, things like that. Um, in fact, uh, we, we have a uh, blog about that, about uh, calcium silicate drying. Um, uh, as far as deterioration goes, typically um, um, there are insulations that, that will degrade uh, under different mechanisms. Uh, things like uh, you have binder burnout with with fiberglass and mineral wool, um, UV, um, and uh, you know tends to deteriorate uh, polyiso and polystyrene foams. Um, generally speaking, the the higher temperature insulations tend to perform better. I think as far as environmental things, um, I suppose everything degrades a little bit. But uh, in a water entrainment in, in uh, calcium silicate, uh, you know, that doesn't harm it. In fact, we form it as a, uh, as a liquid, or uh, with, and then it, it, it dries to a you know, ceramic material. Uh, to answer your question, I, I think they all degrade a little bit. I, I think maybe even calcil over time uh, can too, but, um, but usually the service life of most installations, if used properly, is going to be the life of the asset. This one is for you, Mary, and maybe maybe you, Doug, but Mary, I'm going to direct it at you first. Sure. Um, what happens with the Chinese insulation materials in context of ASTM? Who's responsible for checking that in, in China, Chinese materials? Well, I take a, a stab at the first part, and then if, if Doug needs to add anything technical, he can. Um, ASTM standards are voluntary in use. We would not, we don't mandate or regulate who needs to use the standard. Um, so it would be up to the manufacturer or even the consumer if they're if they're purchasing a product um, that uses the Chinese material. Um, our, and our, I will say that our committees do they are well aware of, of issues that are international and um, you know like so anything that they can do to discuss those issues prior to. The development of a standard, even or even revising a standard, um, they'll take that into consideration. Um, as far as, as monitoring um, those activities, it would be the actual manufacturer and the consumer. Yeah, on to that, it's it's usually uh, uh, it, it's kind of incumbent upon whoever's uh, supplying the, uh, the installation, whether it's it's the distributor or the manufacturer, to to show you know to show test results or show the compliance. Or you know something like that. Um, I think one of, the good, one of the good things that ASTM does is it, it, it does create a level playing field so that uh, you can't create trade barriers, you can't, um, can't exclude people. Um, you know if, if they have a product that meets those specifications. So uh, you know my advice would be uh, you know we don't have insulation police out there, but um, want to make sure that when you're buying something that it's that's suitable. There's there's test data associated with it. Um, and you know, if it's something cr crucial, um, uh, particularly in a refinery like uh, combustibility, then uh, I would certainly make sure that you look at it, uh, 
you know, those kind of characteristics, um, you know, depending on what your application is. Right. Great, thank you. And our final question is for you, Doug. And which coverage is best in terms of the benefits and costs to protect mineral wool from corrosion? Um, can you repeat the question? Sure. It's which coverage is best in terms of benefits and costs to perfect, uh, sorry, to protect mineral wool from corrosion? And I think this might actually be referring to um, jacketing. Okay. okay. Um, well, yeah, you know, the first piece of advice is, you know, uh, keep water out. But, of course, we know it's going to get in. So um, we, we wrote a blog about this, and, and so I, I would suggest uh, I know not not to plug Venture Club, but I know that they they make a really good product. I, I don't know that if they make one for mineral wool, but um, they they do make a really good product for uh, if you're looking for like an ASGA type of material, or um, you could use uh, stucco embossed aluminum and use uh, you know silicone for your sealing the circumferential and longitudinal joints. Um, and my my other suggestion would be to put weave poles um, on the bottom. I think what we did in uh, we detail this in the, in the blog, but um, if you have, uh, I believe it's five eighths inch holes, uh, three feet on center, um, it, it allows the, the insulation to drain very quickly. If you know, if you should happen to have a water intrusion event, so um, so anyway, um, either either one of those two, um, either the venture clutter or the stucco embossed aluminum with the silicone would would uh, help keep uh, that mineral dry and keep pipes protected. Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I know that Doug listed uh, or mentioned a lot of blogs that we have out there. If, you, if you're looking for more information on this, I just recommend that you Google the topic you're looking for and then put John's Manville blog on there. And if we have a topic on it, it's very likely to come up in your Google search. So with, um, that actually concludes our questions. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we do close this with a survey and we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, additionally, if you have any questions that you were unable to ask, you can actually submit those via the survey and we'll respond to you directly via email. And that one question that we are going to take offline, and we'll, we'll contact you directly. Um, so please keep an eye on your inbox for your certificate of completion. Again, that will be there by Friday. And we will be posting a recording of this webinar to the source in the next couple weeks or so, and we'll send out an email when that is complete. So thank you very much for attending today. Uh, we hope you found the information useful and relevant. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly or via the survey. So thank you so much for your time, and have a great week.